coach Ramcharan is on his way towards his PCC. Um, they are uh, sometime early next year. They will be starting a program called the Selfless Coach, which will be a mastery webinar for 30 hours. And today we wanted them here to present some backdrop of that particular program as well, and also take us through a transformational journey in terms of coaching. Uh, something that really attracted me to the work that Kirin was doing was uh, with horses. Um, she lives in New Mexico. Uh, I'm not quite sure, maybe Albuquerque, somewhere nearby. And Ramcharan introduced me to her. Ramcharan was doing his program with Kocharya. He's highly spiritually oriented. He spent half a year in India, especially at uh, Trivanamalai in the Ramanashram. And I got to know, I, I, I work with him closely on several programs uh, in terms of uh, directing them towards certain, uh, let's say, pragmatic aspects of spirituality, which may escape my not so pragmatic Eastern mind. Um, and he introduced me to Kelly uh, in terms of the work that she was doing. And I was truly amazed because uh, not that I grew up with animals, but Thanks to my wife who did. Um, I was introduced to the pleasure of working with animals, uh, be it cats, be it dogs, be it whatever. And someone working with horses, my only experience with horses was when I was trying to feed a horse a sugar cube and the horse caught me in a wife-like clamp. Uh, I <laughs> nearly broke my wrist. So <laughs> quite a bit of an effort to take it out. Fortunately, my sister-in-law was, uh, she was the one who was breeding those horses and she knew them and got them to open their mouth and let me out. Uh, but the intelligence of these animals is amazing. Um, very often I think they are far more intelligent, emotionally intelligent human beings, and I think they are. And the kind of work that Kelly is doing um, by putting people in touch with these animals and get another part of them to emerge as it were and true spiritual sense uh, is truly what we need as coaches. And a part of that, I think today would be sort of conveyed to you in a conversation between Ramcharan and Kelly who share uh, a lot of that spiritual connection uh, between themselves, between us, uh, between the whole ecosystem as it were. So I would leave it there. And uh, before I just uh, hand it over to them, uh, I request all of you, I see still many of you, the posting is still unfortunately is on a default mode. There's nothing that we can do about it. Please shift uh, the chat box in your uh, messaging to all panelists and attendees from all panelists. Uh, because when later when you post questions, when you say something, uh, others will not be able to see and it will be impossible for us to keep repeating each time what you're asking to other people. So please, please, please. Uh, for a moment, be very mindful, not mindless in this particular case. Watch that dialogue and shift it to all panelists and attendees from where you are. And please also let us know where you are from. Uh, that would help uh, people to understand how diverse this particular group is. We have touched about 100. I'm sure we'll be going beyond that in a short while. And at the end of the program, um, you know how the uh, you need to get into the forum. Magda has sent you all the links. You need to go to the forum to, uh, at the end of this program, to be able to claim your CCUs, give your details as they are requested. And some of the videos and podcasts have been already been uploaded for last week, for the last couple of weeks. And each week, at the end of the week, we will try and do that. Sometimes it may take a little time. Just be patient with us a little bit. Um, if you are not able to get the videos and the podcast by the time the session is over. Uh, we won't be able to do that. Um, so, yeah, wish you a fantastic session. And uh, at some point in time, we would be requesting, Ramcharan and Kelly would be requesting some of you to come and join them on the panel uh, to work with them on some of the exercises that they have. Uh, to you, over to you, Kelly, Ramcharan. Okay, thank you, Ram. Thanks for that introduction. It's appreciated. Um, wow, I'm really excited to see so many people from all over the world. So. Uh, hello to everyone all over the world. Um, as as uh, you know, Ram said, I kind of have a background in, in spirituality and spent a lot of time in India. And um, so our topic, which is really about how to leverage presence um, 
in aid of transformation in our, our clients and in you know, larger society and in our relationships, that um, grew out of my background, which is, you know, it was basically meditating in India for a long time, uh, started doing some healing work, both physically and spiritually oriented, and found that um, basically qualities of presence, the way I showed up with people, would affect uh, their entirety, the body, the mind, all of it. It would bring them into balance just by my being present. Um, but there's particular qualities of a deep listening presence that would facilitate that. So when I started to transition into coaching, which I've been doing for close to two years now, um, I, I brought that with me. Um, and I found that there is a lot in the world of coaching about presence oriented coaching, meaning we are not so much looking at the doing aspect, but the, the doing and the thinking and planning being sort of in service to um, somebody's really essential need for growth, transformation, evolution, et cetera. Um, and that when I looked at the ICF, you know, um, definitions of presence or the qualities of presence, they're talking about qualitative, quantitative measures, all really great stuff. And it seems that there's a much greater depth that we can look into what actually is presence. And when I met Kelly, we were with a spiritual teacher in North India, and he was somebody who embodied presence to a phenomenal degree. You can walk into a room with him and without him saying a word, you would be having insights and shifts and it was truly effortless. And so we both feel that, that uh, everybody has the capacity for that. Uh, it's just a matter of orientation and focus. So we're actually developing this course we call the Selfless Coach. And it's about really knowing presence as your effortless true nature and that how through holding that uh, state, you have a tremendous impact in a sense doing nothing almost, but it has a tremendous impact on the people you're working with. And I certainly see it in the way that I, I show up in coaching. It's not about techniques or, or even the how, but it's, it's, it's who and what I am bringing to coaching that facilitates um, the deepest transformation in the clients. So we're gonna have a really cool and um, dip today into the waters that uh, Kelly and I will be taking a deeper look at in our 30 hour course, which starts in late November. So Kelly will tell you a bit about herself and what we're gonna do today. Thanks Ram Charan. Um, hi world, wow, it's just amazing to see that there's so many of us gathered together and um, Ram Charan really said everything just the best, and he's art so articulate that way. So um, thank you, Ram Ramanathan and, and Magda for having us here. And um, uh, today, um, I actually don't want to say anything further about myself because I just feel that what Ram Charan said about where he and I are joining forces to bring elements of contemplative wisdom to the coaching field, and he just said so well. Um, Today we thought we would just have a broad brushstroke view on some of the models that are out there that point to presence, that kind of circle into presence that um, can meet people in that mental place and take them to a place of presence. Um, so we're gonna sort of have a look at some of those models that are out there and then we're gonna work with one in particular called the work of Byron Katie, which again, <clears throat> you know, is a model, but the spirit of the inquiry is so very, very powerful. So if you've done the work before, it's always wonderful to do it again. If you've not experienced the work, then uh, we hope that you enjoy it and find that it's, it can be very transformative. Um, so yeah, so should we just carry on from there, Ramcharan? Should we move on and get going? Let's get going. Let's okay. start. Cool, let me get, I've got a slide for us all here. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's just, uh, you know, I picked this quote from a, a recent uh, Modern Times teacher of, of um, self-inquiry in India, Nisargadatta Maharaj, who some of you might be familiar with. He lived in Bombay, was a simple man, uh, sold, Beatties at a shop and passed away in the early 80s, but he's got some quite remarkable uh, teachings that he left behind. So, so let's look at what he said here. Um, a quiet mind is all you need. 
All else will happen rightly once your mind is quiet. As the sun on rising makes the world active, so does self-awareness affect changes in the mind. In the light of calm and steady self-awareness, inner energies wake up and work miracles without any effort on your part. So we picked this quote because, you know, it, it feels true. It seems to be our experience, you know, in particularly in uh, meditation and contemplative work, it's about coming to that place where something arises from within. We don't even know what it is. It's always emergent. It's always fresh. It's always in the moment. And it's quite, on some level, it's always going to be a mystery how it works. So we really can't define it. Um, but we'd like you to consider a question, um, you know, to really start. And um, I'll, I'll read the question to you twice, you know, just so you can be with it. And if you want to sit with it and then put in the chat box, if you have any response to the question or, you know, how that hits you. Um, and it's that we, what if you could leverage enormous transformative capacities in your clients by your mere presence? And again, just, just take that in as kind of a, a possibility. What if you could leverage enormous transformative capacities in your clients by your mere presence? So and, how and would that shift the way you are, how, the way you work? Yes, Kelly, go ahead. Well, I'm just going to ask maybe here, Ron might have some um, comments that are coming through with that question. What sort of questions arise for you when you think about that? When you think about that, just your presence, just being there with even no questions um, would make a transformative change. Yeah, also check your response to the question. Does something in you doubt that that's possible? Does something in you, what, what does that evoke as a response? Because that is the space that allows for transformation, yes. It would be unbelievable, but could have amazing, phenomenal impact both on me and the coachee. And here's a nice one. Sounds like the coach needs to be so vibrant that his energy level influences the client. So yes, certainly. And we're going to be doing a lot of work in our course on what does an energy level of one person, how does that influence another person? We've got a whole class on that, on kind of um, field resonance between people. Presence can be clearly felt even if the person is no longer in physical form. Yeah, so some people here have a, a connection to that. Presence. Very nice. Coaching via silence is ultimate. It means no boundaries. Okay, yes, thank you, Chaitan. Very good. That's something I was going to say myself, that coaching across boundaries, if we look at what is the commonality across any boundary, it's the fact that all the things on either side exist. They are present. And it may seem ridiculously uh, fundamental uh, or unimportant, um, but in fact, it's, it is presence in its most pure sense that unites everything. Okay, good. Let's have time for just a couple more here. There's a lot of good yeah. ones. It's one thing that, <clears throat> that Ram said to me on a mentoring call that I will never, ever forget, um, and I will share with all of you. He was mentoring me for my MCC assessment, and he said, the coach is very vulnerable. And th that was very powerful for me because it, when he said that, there's such a vulnerability to just being present. Um, and that that and to lean into the sufficiency of that presence. So um, to me, that presence can feel very powerful, but it can also feel very vulnerable because I'm not leaning into everything I know or all the clever questions. <clears throat> what else do you see there, Ron? Yes, uh, presence doesn't mean physical silence, Pankaj says. Um, total agreement with that. Agreement. There is, there, it, it is unaffected by activity or quietness. So. Um, 
the reason that an inner silence is helpful in, in, in coming into that state is because it creates an entryway for presence. But once that connection with presence is there, it facilitates any activity. It's really not disturbed. Um, so it also, without going too far into it, that can lead into a more tantric understanding of, um, of presence-based coaching because uh, where action and actionlessness are not really so different, there's an energetic um, dynamism that comes into play in people's transformative process. Now, I can get very heady talking about this stuff, but it's, <laughs> that's why I can describe what I experienced. <laughs> right. Shall we move on to some of the models and then get get let everybody experience some of the work? How's that sound? Yeah, totally. Let's okay, do great. That. So um, <clears throat> thanks, everybody, for being so engaged. So we, we, we wanted to give you just a broad brushstroke on, on some of the models that are out there. We're going to throw up a few slides so you can see them. Um, and then we'll get to work with the, with the work of Byron Katie. Please have, uh, take a moment to, if you don't have paper by your side, um, grab a journal, grab some paper, grab the back of a napkin, because um, you're going to be doing some writing. So uh, for the work of, of Byron Katie, so uh, be sure that you have paper with you. Um, what we wanna share about these models is um, they very much are like that uh, proverbial finger pointing at the moon. They're not the moon. Um, I have seen over the decades of facilitating people that it's very easy for people to get caught on models and stay with models. Um, Models are meant to kind of liberate consciousness rather than kind of make it narrow. So it's with this spirit that we share <laughs> these models with you. Um, there is a spirit of inquiry that when earnestly asked either of oneself or to your client or the client asked of themselves that can liberate deeper presence and sort of take away some of the obscurity that can that can seem to get in the way. Um, so I'm going to just share some of these. Um, so here's our first one here. Yeah, and as we share these, just you know, bear in mind you might want to look at um, not only understanding each model, but what is it that uh, what are the commonalities and differences? And this is going to be a very brief um, overview here, just a yeah. really a couple very of minutes. Very brief. <laughs> um, theory U, we've all, many of us have done a lot of work with, and thanks to Ram, you know, he's really brought that into uh, Kocharya and our experience. Uh, Otto Sharmer's work, um, great model for transformational change. Uh, and, and, you know, starting, he uses the, the U model, you can see on the screen, um, kind of dipping down into consciousness, uh, suspending, basically letting go of um, sensing in, observing, letting go letting go of your past, letting go of whatever model is there, and connecting with the heart, and then going into what he calls presencing, you know, really contacting what is it that wants to emerge, and uh, not in that place, not basing your experience on the past or the future, but just being with what is, and slowly a shift happens where something starts to come into consciousness, the future starts to emerge, there's a prototyping where the, uh, the mind the cognitive mind is brought back in and then there is moving into action. So it's just a really nice way of um, describing this shift where we drop the past, drop the doing, let ourselves sink in, not know, and then be with what emerges and help bring it into manifestation. So that's, that's one model and that's a very deep model. All these models you can go way into. Mm -hmm. yeah. This one that comes one. from uh, the 15 commitments of conscious leadership. And um, basically there's four quadrants. Uh, to me, this is very much the victim stance. Life is happening to me. Um, but the next, the next sort of evolutionary step, and these are all mindsets, of course, they're not, they're not people, is by me that I am able to manifest things in my life. Um, but then there's an even deeper evolutionary step through me. Life is happening through me. Things, events happen through me, which is a lot more surrendered. And then there's as me, um, which is life is me, uh, a sort of oneness state. And so the, the, the folks at 15 Commitments uh, use this model for people to track where they are in any given moment. Am I in a to me moment or a by me moment, a through me moment or an as me moment? 
this is very useful. Um, and again, you don't have to stick to the model to, um, to, to make a kind of inquiry as a coach. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's another. Shall we move on? Whoops, sorry, everybody. You're seeing my screen that you don't need to see. Um, the next, next one here is the Awareness Wheel by Dan Siegel. Um, this model um, represents pure awareness as the hub and the things that we are aware of as the rim. So we can be aware of um, things set through our senses, through touch and taste and smell, or the interior of the body, or our interconnectedness with another. So this is sort of a mind map that maps where an awareness can travel. Yeah, this is taken from Ken Wilber's work, a, a extreme, extremely simple um, graphic of his work. It's a, it's a very detailed body of work, spiral dynamics. Um, and he basically is talking about how uh, consciousness moves through different levels and it sort of goes in a spiral so that we'll keep experiencing similar things in life, but that uh, according to our state of consciousness, we're approaching our experience from a very different place. So it moves from an instinctive through animistic, uh, dominant, authoritarian, achievist, up to communitarian, and systemic and holistic at the higher end of the, the spiral. And um, it's a really helpful way to look at where uh, clients or systems may be, um, what is their worldview? What is the paradigm they're at? And what does that say about what level of consciousness that they're kind of uh, most oriented to? S similar in some ways to um, chakra uh, work, obviously. Um, he gives different colors here. He has his own models. It's a, really profound model. So um, please also look more into Ken Wilber's work. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, yeah, the garden, go can, I, can I interject here, Ramcharan? That the, the garden variety version of spiral dynamics where I found that to be really helpful is when a client says to me, you know, I thought I dealt with my mother, you know, 20 years ago. Well, that's because they're dealing with their mother issue from a completely different perspective now. So we often loop back and revisit issues, um, but from a different consciousness level. And that sort of helps people to relax that they're not moving backwards. In fact, they're actually, they are making progress in their life. Yes, that those circles are upward. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, one thing I just want to point out about these models is, um, they're in a sense maps of experience and also maps of evolution. So there's a distinction to be made between, you know, the process of consciousness um, and the evolution of, that people can make, people's individuals, organizations, systems can make. Um, and um, ultimately though, presence remains untouched. So us holding that space of pure presence as coaches and uh, helping sort of facilitate our clients be in that space in themselves, that is really bringing in uh, what's often called the, the space of possibility or pure potentiality so that the consciousness wants to evolve. Um, so these models are both about presence and about the interplay of presence and process. So I'm just curious, um, Ram Charan, if other people have any other models they want to throw up in the chat that we could just name out loud um, that are powerful and useful that anybody would like to share. Yeah, well, yeah. Or, or anything else that uh, has been, you know, mm -hmm. any insights or sharings you'd like to bring in. Heart math. Oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> yes, Robert Diltz. Okay, good. Does consciousness evolve or is it changeless? That's a great That's question. That's a great question. Uh, I would say much depends on your definition of consciousness. <laughs> it does both. Yes, thank you, Denise. <laughs> Richard Barrett, Seven Levels of Consciousness. Okay. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know that. That's actually yeah, good. Thank that's, you. Uh... So anyway, there are, there are a lot of models out there. Three principles of Sydney Banks. Yes. Also. Uh -huh. Right. Great. Uh, Terrific. Th thank yeah. you. I found um, that the more 
arrows I have in my quiver, um, just the more I can kind of navigate other people's language and, um, and currencies that they're dealing in. And um, it just makes for a much more dynamic and juicy conversation. What's the uh, Brahma Kumaris? Cool. So, okay. Should we um, start engaging in the work? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, the work of Byron Katie is um, basically four inquiry questions that you ask um, to any drama that you have. And um, <clears throat> I first encountered the work long before it became the work of Byron Katie. Um, it was, I just uh, got to know Katie's uh, biography and uh, she's a really special person. You can, you can research her. Um, what we love about the work is that it allows you to be perfectly human, perfectly judgmental, which is what Katie would say, we all do so well, even if we say we don't, we judge and criticize really well ourselves and others. And so it allows us to start right where we are in the drama, like right in the thick of the drama. And then to that drama, there are a series of questions to um, earnestly inquire into. And those questions start to peel away the appearance of veils that leave us with something much more empty, much more present, um, much more true to who we are, um, however we define that. And, and so, um, so I'll just throw up a slide real quick to show you how it works and then we're gonna start doing it ourselves uh, together. <clears throat> yeah, and if I can say this is, um, it's related to a question that just came in that what makes it yeah. important for a coach to have models to create presence. So presence is not something that's created. Presence is your fundamental nature. It's veiled by beliefs, by habits, by uh, identity, all these things that we hold in the mind. So it's really about undressing presence. Um, and the models are just a way to kind of look at, help look at your own experience and your client's experience in a way that points out where is your presence and where is it distracted possibly by, um, by non-essential functions. And I don't, by non-essential, I mean things that are not really uh, the most essential to your nature. So it's, it's sort of a way of navigating. Um, and that also, um, before we go into Byron Katie's work, this whole question of inquiring into one's experience, the relationship to presence is absolutely key. If you look at, uh, if you're familiar with Ramana Maharshi, he used to tell people just to ask, who am I? That's, that is the heart of inquiry. And that brings people into a state of tremendous presence. Um, so much so that actually they don't even exist as people at that point. One exists as that state of presence. So um, a lot of these models have uh, processes that come along with them, which are ways of inquiring into people's experience deeply. Um, Byron Katie's stuff that Kelly's about to lead us in is absolutely brilliant at that level, as many of you will experience today. Mm -hmm. um, that was a great question, actually. And yeah. You know, I find <clears throat> my experience is that we are encouraged to meet people exactly where they're at. Sometimes someone is really ready for a question that is as powerful as who am I? Um, sometimes that's a violence to, um, to go there. Sometimes people have to be met really in the thick of their drama. Um, and that's very compassionate. So, uh, okay, so I'll share this. So here is the... Uh, here are the four questions. Is it true? Can you absolutely know that it's true? What happens when you believe that thought? Who would you be? And I just add, what would life be like without that thought? And then you turn the judgment around. So we're actually gonna work with this right now. <clears throat> and here's uh, what I'm going to uh, invite you to do. Get out your piece of paper. And um, think about, think about 
whatever's kind of got you right now. And we're going to invite you to be really spiritually incorrect, <laughs> to really <laughs> let yourself, let your inner critic, your inner child completely off the leash and um, go for it. It may be about a politician. It may be about your husband or your wife or your best friend or your colleague. So think about something that's kind of got you right now and write just a paragraph about what that scenario is. Um, and uh, you know, in, in my example, I'm going to bring up, let's, uh, my husband has all these chores to do around the house. He leaves tons of them unfinished. Um, I always feel like I have to nag him <laughs> to get them done. <laughs> um, I wish that he would listen to me. So this is where I'm going to go just as an example. Um, but here are some very specific sentences I'm going to invite you to write. The first sentence is, what should they do? What should they do? Or what should they not do? Um, what should change about the situation? So you can write this down and then you can flesh it out because we're going to give you about 10 minutes to write. What advice for, do you have for this person or this scenario? In my case, they should just not be so busy that they can't pay attention to what needs to be done around the house. They should take better care of themselves, okay? What advice do you have for them? What do you need them to do so that you're happy? Again, please don't be spiritually correct here. We want you to really go for it. Yes, don't be polite. Don't be polite. <laughs> what do you need them to do in order for you to be happy? I need him to just listen to me. I need him to get these things done. I need him not to leave so many things unfinished. Um, and what are, your, what are your complaints about this situation? He never listens to me. He um, is moving too fast. He doesn't take good care enough, good enough care of himself. Okay, so you can see where I'm going. So what should they do? What do they need to do to make you happy? What are your complaints about them? Um, what advice do you have to give them? And what do you want from them? Okay. And there was one question, which is a good question. Can it be about myself too? Yes. Yes, it certainly can. Yeah. Um, I should be making more money, you know, whatever. So yeah, go for it. If you want to go totally nutso on self-judgment, that's awesome. Okay. Are there any other questions? And we're going to give you, let's give them 10 minutes to go for it. Hey, Ramcharan, do you think that's too much time or what do you reckon? I think, uh, yeah, 10 minutes and just, um, be as petty and judgmental as you can, and <laughs> really. Okay. Um, key all the questions at once. Maybe Kelly, do you want to repeat the questions for people who are didn't get them the first time? You mean that to fill out the judge, judge, judging uh, part of their journal? Yes. So um, what do you want? First, you do a paragraph on kind of your scenario. And then, but these are the, the, these are the very specific sentences to write out. What, what do you want them to do or not do? I want them to listen to me better. I want them to stop gambling, whatever it is. What advice do you have for them? They should take better take care of themselves. What should they do? What shouldn't they do? What do you need for them to do in order for you to be happy? And what complaints do you have about them? They're so selfish. They never think about me. They should be grateful for all I did for them. That kind of stuff. Uh, you just write it to yourself. Don't, uh, th this part, we don't, you don't need to post. 
Yeah, you don't have to post it. <laughs> this is your own private drama. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really have fun with this. You know, yeah. everybody tells you to be nice. We're telling you don't be nice when you write this <laughs> down. Just really right from the gut. <laughs> Uh, Kerry Ramchandran, do you want them to stay silent for 10 minutes or do you want them to answer these as they go along? Somebody is um, asked, I'm wanting them, to... we're wanting them to uh, journal this, yeah. you know, this scenario, this, this drama that they, um, so to write down, you know, what the scenario is and then what the, the person or what they should do, what they shouldn't do, what they need them to do, that kind of thing. We're just giving them a chance to sort of f flush that out before we apply the inquiry to those things. Yeah, which means for 10 minutes, um, uh, you, you, you want total silence? Um, if it helps them to write down, to journal a little bit, that's fine, sure. Yeah, Kelly, if you want, you can just, you know, put the placeholder slide and we can, um... That, that'll give people more of a sense that they can be in their own uh, process for a few minutes. Okay. Yeah, you said about muting. You can mute yourself, Ramchiran, Kelly, both of you. Okay. You have, you have the mute switch. You just have to mute and then unmute yourself when you're ready. We'll give you um, two more minutes to finish up. Okay, start to um, slowly wind it up. <clears throat> Great. So we will um, ask for volunteer, a volunteer to come and do, um, to do this with us based on their, what they've written. Um, <clears throat> but before that, we'll, we'll do it a little bit together. Um, so take one of your sentences that you've written down, possibly the one that feels maybe the most loaded, the most charged, um, 
possibly one that says what they should or shouldn't do or what they need to do or how they need to be in order to make you happy. Just pick one sentence. And then apply the first question. Is it true? Is it true that they should, in my case, listen better to me? Is it true that they should listen better to me? Can I really know that in the scheme of all the universal laws and energies and everything, can I really know that it's true that he should listen to me? So when I ask myself that question, I, I don't know that it's true. It's, it's what I think, it's what my preference would be, but I don't really know in the vast scheme of things if that's what he should be doing. Um, and, <clears throat> and really just kind of let that settle for a little bit. What's really true is he's not listening to me, or at least that's how I see it. He's not, that's actually what's happening. And as Katie would say, when we argue with reality, we suffer. So he's not listening. That's what's happening right now. So what happens, how do I react when I believe that my husband, my partner should listen better to me? So ask yourself that third question. What happens, who are you? when you believe that thought, they should listen better or they should whatever, what happens in your, in your experience? Kelly, do you, do you wanna put up the slide of, of uh, the, the four questions again? Sure, yeah, great. That, that really helps guide the inquiry. Yeah, thank you. So is it true? Can you absolutely know that it's true? And what happens when you believe that thought? Well, for me, I start to separate from the person I care about. I get angry. I get resentful. Um, I stop listening to them. That's some of the things. I start to suffer. Anyway, so really flesh it out. What happens when, in your experience when you believe that thought? Ramchar and I wonder if there's any, because um, I can't see it with the slide, if there's any chats coming up with people answering any of these. If not, we'll move on. Uh, just when you argue with reality, you suffer. Someone says this. Yes. <laughs> Actually, uh, Katie, uh, who originated this work, says when you argue with reality, you lose, but only all the time. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but only all the time. Yes. Um, uh, you get reactive. Right. So... Yeah, and and uh, please feel free as we're going through this. If you if you're having any insights or responses, um, to share. Wow, mm -hmm. when I believe this thought, oh my God, my stomach clenches, and I want to get revenge, and I'm angry at everyone. Um, wh whatever is coming up for you in this process, please share. We have more expectations. Yes. Okay. Yes, great one. I have more expectations. Okay, here's a question. Yes, it is true. Then what? That was my confirmation. <laughs> um, so I'd be very curious to know what is true. Do you, do you want to um, do some work with, Kay, with Kelly? Would you like to, to do that? This is from um, Denise, if that's okay. Just well, I'll tell you what, let's pause Denise for one second, because I yeah. love the ones that are really true. Um, <laughs> and um, Denise, if you're okay, we'll keep going through the process. And then if you'd like to get on, we can, we can play with this. Um, who would you be or what would life be at like without that thought? What, are you getting any answers, Ram Charan? Still getting answers for number th three. Number three, that's a juicy one. It's a juicy one. So yeah, so take a moment and just shift back and now look again, look at question number four. Who would you be or what would life be like without that thought? Or let's say it without that belief. Who would you be and what would your experience, what would life be like? 
So it's starting to go from the previous answer, disconnected, scary. It moves into peaceful, joyful, free and lovable, more freedom without that thought. I can claim my power back. Good one. Very good one. Yeah. And we, by the way, we're not, and nor is Katie, we're not implying you shouldn't have that belief. It's just an inquiry. Wow. When I really hold that belief close to myself and I believe it, I suffer. And when I don't, I'm peaceful, huh? <laughs> right. And who would choose to suffer? Right. So, so go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to say there's an important one here. I really like this from Lorraine. When we do dig down to what is true, we realize that it is our reality as compared to where that person is on their journey. Mm hmm. Yep. Anything else you want to sh share, Ramcharan, and then we'll talk about the turnaround. Uh, people saying peaceful, <clears throat> sync, flow, freedom, uh, the normal loving person I already am. Okay, good. I think that's uh, that's awesome. Feel, feel free to keep sharing. Great. Yeah, let's go to the turnaround. This is really nice. Great. And again, as coaches, these are you can you can ask these questions in very non-synthetic ways, right? You can be very organic with how you ask these questions, but. They're beautiful questions and they're, they're very open-ended. So then there's a thing called a turnaround. So where you have the person's name, you will put your word, your name. So if my <clears throat> sentence is, he should listen to me, I should listen to me. And just feel what that does in you. Is that not as true or even more true? Do you listen to yourself? I should listen to me. Now, the turnaround's very nuanced. If I'm judging myself, uh, I should make more money. The turnaround would be, well, I don't have to make more money. That would be the turnaround. So the turnaround's quite nuanced. And when you turn it around, it can also be uh, nonlinear, meaning I should listen to me. Well, if I listen to me more, I might honor myself more. I might honor my values more. I might not be so critical of others, or I should listen to me, listen to all my judgments and how, how, um, how much suffering it brings me. So turn your sentence around. Some turnarounds are, um, you know, uh, my partner does listen to me. That's another turnaround. What are some of the ways he does listen to you? And another one possible turnaround for self or other is let's say, oh, uh, you know, I should be more together. Well, I shouldn't be more together. So there are numerous ways to start to flip these sentences around. Mm -hmm. And we'd be curious, you know, again, keep post posting feedback. What sort of insights open up as you do this turnaround? Mm -hmm. Would you say the judgment is my projection? That's a very good question, Shanaz. Would you say the judgment is your projection? Yes, that's a simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> Agree, okay. <laughs> what else is going on for people with this? Uh, uh, how are you feeling with this turnaround? What happens in your experience as you um, start to flip these judgments around? Higher awareness. It can be an aha moment. How can I be responsible to change the situation? Great. Less judgmental, more at peace. Turned around. They offer self-awareness. Easy to expect from others, but difficult by oneself. Well, it's a lot of answers coming in. This is great. Love this degree of participation. More accepting. Open up to possibilities and curious. Make you conscious of what you ask. Understand their situation. Very nice. Uh, okay, someone doesn't get the self turnaround piece. I think that um, probably the, the best way is to, because um, we have some time, so we can, we can play with it with the, probably one or two people. We could do a yeah. speed date, speed dating. 
<laughs> it's a magnet for zeroing in on what's my work. Beautiful. Um, Very beautiful. Wow. Really beautiful. That really hits it. Yeah. So not to get too into planting things in your mind, but when you bring the power of your judgment and you undo what is holding it in place, wow, that gives you a lot of power. And it also shows you exactly where you are stuck mm -hmm. or believe yourself to be stuck and you believe it's someone else's fault. So um, two hands raised, Ram. Um, yes. Yeah, uh, we have uh, two people, Pankaj and Chris, who have raised hands. Usually that means they would like to talk. Um, I asked them whether they have any questions they haven't answered. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it's a or, or they'd like to volunteer. Is that what they're doing to, to be to do the work with us? Pankaj says it's a I mistake. Have no, I have no idea because I did ask whether they have any questions. No, it must be a mistake, Pankaj. Okay. Denise, I don't know whether Chris do we want yeah, Denise so, up here? Yeah, Denise, if you want to, then you just <coughs> ask Mark that she would uh, promote her to the panel. If Come you want on up, Denise. Yeah, uh, Magda, could you? No, she said. Yeah. <laughs> no. no, okay. So, okay. There are two, two others who have raised their hands. Priya. Priya. And Priya. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I respect yeah. that, Priya Denise. Priya says yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think Magda would have to do the need for. That's okay, Denise. That's totally fine. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. though. And and Denise, we will we can talk about the the true piece too because it does come up for people, so we can generically address it. Yeah. So. Um, so who's our person? Who's coming up to play with us? Priya, you want to? There you Hi, go. Hi, Priya. Priya. Hello, this is Priya from India, Mumbai. Hi. Hello. <clears throat> All right, so I, I did put down uh, the description as you suggested, and mm -hmm. I did it for myself. I first started doing it for somebody else, and then I said, when you said there is an option for doing it for yourself, I quickly jumped to that because that's what I'd really like to work on. Okay, very good. So tell us your, tell us your drama with yourself. And the drama with myself is that uh, there is qualification, there is experience, there is already some amount of, you know, reasonable amount of work done. And yet, I am not able to consolidate and build my business to the point where I'm feeling the sense of confidence and the sense of, yeah, you know, I'm doing it all. Uh, mm -hmm. There seems to be an inertia. There seems to be the sense of, you know, not doing enough to, you know, garner whatever I can garner from the world and also share with the world, like with abundance, the fact that you're in a coaching space, you want to be able to, you know, reach out to more people, help them lead more you know, high potential lives. <coughs> and and while in doing so, wanting them to lead the high potential life, I still in question myself, am I leading my life to high potential? You know, am I doing enough for myself for my career? Okay. My own self? That's where I was. That's my situation. Okay. Yeah. And what are your judgments of yourself? What you, what should you should you or should you not be doing? I shouldn't be bloody procrastinating and I should get on my ass and get on the road and do business development. Why the okay. what? Sorry, am I not doing that? You know, I'm sorry for okay. being profane. Yeah. So can we can we pause with that one? That um, yeah. I should I should get off my ass and get on with this and get on with yeah. the quit quit procrastinating. Um, okay, great. So thank you so I much. To add here, the procrastination probably stems from fear that there is a sense that uh, it would go to wane. You know, I would not be good enough and I would not make success. And so I sit back, find excuses to not get. <laughs> So you're not good enough. Is that true? But like, but don't be glib with this answer, right? I want you to really feel, feel into that question. Is it true you're not good enough? Can you really know without a shadow of a doubt that you're not good enough? No. And when you believe that thought, even subtly, that perhaps you're not good enough, when you entertain that doubt, what happens to you? Well, I, you know, sort of want to get into my shell. I don't want to do nothing. I want to sit home, you know, do lots of other, you know, pretend work or trying to develop proposals, develop ideas. But I'm 
you're not going there meeting people, you know. So because you have that sense, because I have that sense uh, of not being good enough, I keep sort of saying, okay, when this happens, then I'll go. When this happens, then I'll go. You know, when this goes, when this milestone happens, then I will be good enough. Right. So, so you can see that, like, by by not really addressing that belief by not really looking at square in the eye and, and asking, is it a really, really true that it creates a whole kind of universe of events that follow afterwards where you feel like going in your shell and then you don't quite do the things you wish you would do, which keeps reinforcing the belief that you're not good enough because if you were good enough, you would do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So what, if you just for a moment got really present with the, possibility that that belief weren't in your body mind heart what would that be like wow that would be awesome i mean if i were to put this thought just outside of me um then the, the world is my oyster then you know so okay. and so can you see a reason just one small reason to drop that belief that you're not good enough. And you don't have to drop it, but can you see a reason to drop it? Uh, a reason to drop it. I hear that without it, the world is your oyster. And with it, you climb into the oyster. <laughs> So can you see a reason to drop it? Help me, Katie, a little bit. Say again, Priya, I didn't hear you. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm not able to find. Doing all right? Yeah, I'm just like a little bit. We, um, somewhere a thought comes into our consciousness that says, I'm not good enough. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, we think it's there because it's true. But it's just there because it's there. It's just there because it's there. It's not there because it's true. And no one gave you the possibility to stop and look it straight in the face and, and see, is it really true? And so what's the turnaround? I'm not good enough. What's the turnaround? Do I need to be good enough? I am good enough. Or I am good enough. I am good enough. So just feel that. I am good enough. And does it resonate for you at all? I'm not so sure right now. Is it okay if I come in? Here for a moment. Yeah, go. There's a there's a, a piece in this. You know, if you really look at uh, the third question of who or what would I be without this belief, just to come back to there, um, if you if you want to do that for a moment, Priya. Yeah. Um, when you see that this is just a thought, it's just a belief, an unquestioned belief, and that in questioning it, you have seen that it's not true. Um, before you go to replace it with another thought. Uh, to try to counteract it, just be in that place of possibility of, okay, who or what would I be without this uh, thought? And, and as you said, the world is my oyster. Can you, can you drop into that um, space again of not believing this thought to be true, not holding this thought, not identifying with it? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Then can you speak from that place? Who, who or what are you? 
Yeah, I'm enough. I'm enough. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> That's so beautiful. Beautiful, yes. Lovely. And Priya, your your <clears throat> your presence when you say that is so moving that I feel emotional. And that's yeah. how powerful that is. And thank you for being so vulnerable on this call. It's really, uh, I really want to honor that. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Thank you so much. So we're going to, we're going to let Priya just have some space. Does anybody else want to, want to come and, and uh, play perhaps with, with one that has to do with another person and not themselves. Priya, are you okay to, to hang in with us? so much Priya. Thanks Priya. Uh, actually Ramcharan, why don't you read some of the comments right now first and then and then we'll play with another person. Um, a lot of thanks and uh, support going out to Priya. Um, yeah. Narrative, yeah. how does the narrative serve me was a, a good question from Shanaz. That is very much what this is about. That could be part of the inquiry. Mm -hmm. um, and Denise says, narrative helps us to evaluate in a different way by activating our prefrontal cortex. It certainly helps us to evaluate in a different way. Uh, it can also some, often not be true. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so would you want Shanaz on the panel, uh, Ramchurun Kelly? That, that would be great. I'd like to say something about narrative because that was really rich. Um, yeah. OK, uh, let me see if I, I can do that. Otherwise, uh, okay. yeah, Magda should be able to do that. Narrative, narrative is very powerful. Um, okay. And, and narrative can, can not panel, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Ron. Narrative is very powerful. Narrative can, you know, elevate us to other possibilities. Um, you know, I, for example, I've stopped saying I'm busy. I was so busy. I've stopped saying that word. That was like, that narrative was so awful for me. Now I say I live such a full and interesting life. <laughs> but I'm always interested to know whenever a narrative starts to limit me, it feels too tight. You know, ultimately all narratives are too much, right? Um, and you can disappear into the narrativeness, listness. <laughs> but um, yeah, I love that about narratives. Was there anything else? Kelly, uh, yeah, as we go into Shanaz's the question on narratives, there's one question there I think which would be very meaningful. Yep. Anita has a question, what permission can I give myself when I think this, I mean, whatever that thinking is, letting go the thought that I'm not good enough, letting go something else. Um, uh, we all feel invalidated for some reason, and we believe that someone has to give us the permission. So what is this that, that would allow us to give ourselves the permission to think that we are good, oh. that we don't need anybody's permission? That's, a, that's beautiful. So um, I'll answer that a bit in Ramchar, and I think you'll have a slightly different perspective too. That's a great Yeah, question. I'd actually like to hear the question again. Yeah, say it one more time. It's there on the chat box, uh, Anita Sashdev, I think. What permission can I give myself when I think this? I, I guess what she means by think this is uh, like the question that you asked uh, Priya, for example. Right. What makes you, what would make you think that you are good? Or what would what make you give up the thought that you are not good, whatever. Okay, okay. So, yeah, great question. <clears throat> um, in my experience, it, it's sort of like what, what Ram Charan did with Priya. Understanding how much suffering that thought brings me is very powerful for me. Um, and, and, and understanding that it creates suffering and, and I don't need to replace that thought with a new thought. I don't need to suddenly believe I'm all powerful. I don't need to believe that. But I, what I can know is believing that I'm not enough really hurts me. So I can just not believe anything. You know, if it, but I can hang out in that place of, gosh, my experience without that thought is really nice. 
and really powerful. So I think I'll just be there for a while. You don't have to now suddenly believe you're like amazing. That's, that's way too much to ask. <clears throat> what would you say, Ramcharan? I, I go back to Vedanta, actually. Uh, and again, back to Ramana Maharshi. Um, and where somebody asked him, is sorrow a thought? And he, you know, he's very absolute. He said, all thoughts are sorrowful. Um, so this is the problem with trying to create relentlessly positive thinking is that it, it's cyclical. As long as we're jumping for any belief about ourselves, we are in some sense disempowering what we are without a belief. And it seems to me the power of inquiry is to come to a place where you do not need to latch on to a new concept. Because most concepts, or you could say from an absolute perspective, any concept of who or what you are, what any situation is, is a limitation, is a, a facsimile, and it's not the reality. The point is to free ourselves, to liberate ourselves, and to spread that liberation to our clients by knowing that space in ourselves. Um, and even to look at, well, what is it that says I now need to formulate a new belief? Is there a fear? I'm not enough without a new positive belief. Right. So the inquiry can keep going on in this. Yeah, that's beautifully said. Shall we play with uh, Shanaz? Hi. I am intrigued by by this part of the conversation and I'm integrating what previous webinars in, in this past week have taught us and I'm looking at head, heart and gut um, mm. that the other uh, panelists to work with. And I'm thinking if the narrative is loudest in my head, I would want to get curious about, you know, what's the response to that narrative from my heart center, from my mm. gut center or, you know, visit another place in myself to try and mediate this narrative and, and get, get an argument going in there instead of just accepting it as, as the truth that paralyzes me mm -hmm. uh, or that blocks me or that, you know, blocks energy from, from forward motion uh, or from just being another way with it. So, so that I, I, I find useful and, and curious for myself about which narrative, where's the narrative the loudest? Mm. Um, right. and, and, and the other piece that we had recently on polarities, you know, what, what's the tension between the fear? Uh, and you mentioned fear a moment ago, um, the fear versus the outcome. And you did it so beautifully, Priya did it so wonderfully about the world is my oyster. Um, and looking at, you know, the fear that's holding us from, from, from that oyster. Mm. Um, so it's, it, it, it's the fear and what's the, how the fear is, you know, strangling us or holding us uh, or resting our energy. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Thanks for a wonderful dialogue. Thank you so much. I yeah, love that was great. About the loudest narrative. I love that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and I, I appreciate you're talking about Alan Seal's work, I think, the transform, transformative presence, transformational presence work, of, and, and getting a dialogue between those three centers. And, you know, it is fantastic work. I experienced a bit of, of it myself, um, and that can totally be interwoven with other forms of inquiry. I'd, I'd say that if you put that together with some of Katie's work, it br could be brilliant. Where is that voice? Yeah. Um, I'd also say about the fear question, um, everything is energy. So fear, I've often heard it said, false evidence appearing real is fear. Um, huh. Fear is more in how we believe ourselves to be in relationship to our experience. That's where fear comes in. And we are believing some form of limitation that gives us a sense that we are in danger, we can come to an end. It's, it triggers our existential need for survival. Um, I would say as long as there's fear, and yeah, thank you for you. Uh, can you mute yourself, please? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'd say as long as there's fear, um, there is something that it can be inquired into more deeply. There's a discovery that can be made. So the energy often shifts from fear to, it expands into excitement, or you can experience it in the body, do this sort of somatic inquiry you're talking about. Um, so really important piece to bring in, because it oh, is the block. Yeah. Here's a great question. Um, 
Love the comment that we need to liberate ourselves from judgment as to who I am. However, isn't it important that we have a sense of self to feel grounded? Yeah. Um, wow, that's a great question. I love great questions. Um, well, so I can always return to a sense of self. That's, that's the easy part. Liberating myself from um, that sense of self, when that sense of self is painful, <clears throat> that's the art form. And there's this beautiful quote from, I think it's Nizar Gadada um, Ramcharan about, um, do you remember it about between these two, my yes. life flows, yeah. right? Um, remember what love, it is? Yeah, love tells me I'm everything, wisdom tells me I'm nothing. And between these two banks, the river of my life flows. Yeah, and so it's self selflessness self selflessness yes. and they are complementary they're not polarities um yeah yum love that question so let's see we've got a it's an 8 11 do we want to do um but there's let's, more i think i think we should just open the floor Ram well Char. actually kelly i was going to say i would love to pose a question for because we have mostly coaches here about yeah. um how do you think that what we've been discussing today can can increase your um your qualities of presence as a coach and how, what impact might that have? Just, you know, people are welcome to put up any sharing, any question, but uh, to start to bring it into, how does this impact your, uh, not only your self-understanding, but your, um, your functioning as a coach? What impact might this have? Oh, but aren't these thoughts an opportunity to question why we feel this way, reflect, learn, and grow? 100%. Also, a great, also a great question. Uh, absolutely. Um, it's everything you can. I think Ram Charan said it the best when he said this inquiry can go deeper, deeper, deeper. It just depends on where you want to go and what serves you and your client the most. Can get to the real work quickly by using and asking these questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exercise we did today seems to be more about handling limiting belief. Absolutely. Handling or, um, or transcending. Yeah. <laughs> Although it doesn't argue, this is the beauty of this work. It doesn't argue with beliefs. Right. You, you, like, you, what happens? You just look at it. There's no mm -hmm. judgment. There's no, there's not an agenda to get rid of them. There's no moral high ground to this work. He's definitely not. Um, making me more aware of what presence I'm giving myself so, so I can give oh, my to clients. my clients more. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. that's a beautiful piece of presence oriented coaching and about the work that Kelly and I are developing in the course is really about uh, knowing uh, the vastness and so many aspects of one's own presence. Very profound discussion. It will relieve a lot of pressure to perform as a coach. Being present would be enough. Yes. Beautiful. The inquiry allows one to peel back the onion and move back to from what from the what is to the possibilities very quickly as it brings down barriers. Cool. What you think expands? Yes. It brings up an amazing amount of self-conscious. I'm <clears throat> inter consciousness. Yeah, I was just gonna say. <laughs> Yes, it does, mm -hmm. and self-awareness. We see ourselves in others most times. So um, it, actually in Katie's work, she says, what I thought was you is me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, it's really very transpersonal. I'm sure Fiona would agree. It creates the capacity to step back and think again. Absolutely, it creates, mm -hmm. what is that capacity, that space? Yeah. Um, Ram Charan asked that I share just really briefly about how I first encountered the work. Um, I was on a plane uh, flying to Copenhagen and I was reading uh, Byron Katie's autobiography and at that point the book didn't really have the, it had the questions but not in a format. It was just what she had started to inquire for herself to pull herself out of a kind of insanity that was happening for her. So I'm sitting in the airplane with some socks on my foot and 
I didn't really have a particularly loud narrative um, going on. So I just thought, well, I guess I could ask this question to anything. So I looked down at my foot that had a sock on it. And I said, it's a sock. Is it true? I've been told it's a sock, but is it a sock? <laughs> and honestly, you can ask that question, is it true, once and very sincerely, and you never need to ask, ask it again because it turns your universe inside out. What do I get when I believe that thought, it's a sock? Well, I get to feel separate from everything. There's a sock, there's a foot, there's a person, there's a chair, there's an airplane. And at that moment, everything kind of turned inside out and there was no line between sock and leg and foot and chair and seat and me and other. And that was such a profound experience. It's a tree. Can I know that that's true? What do I, what happens in my experience when I say that's a tree and I believe it, I get to feel separate from the tree. I, I limit what the tree is or isn't. Can I see a reason to drop that belief? Yes. What happens when I drop that belief? The whole world dissolves into connection. Mm. Very it? nicely put, what dissolves into connection. And it, it, it brings to my mind that as we, the question's coming up of how we work with uh, clients from this, so it kind of gets to a deeply transpersonal existential level, which, you know, of who is the client? Is there a client? <laughs> who am I? As a, who's the coach? And these are actually the kinds of questions we're going to be looking at in our course a lot. Um, and, you know, it seems it can be a bit cognitive or, you know, unconnected. That's why we love this work, because it brings it down very deeply into your direct experience that when we don't have these beliefs, even about that I exist separately from my client, and you're just sitting in presence with yourself, the level of resonance, the level of intimacy, the level of um, connectedness that happens is, it's like a turbocharger, and it brings tremendous transformative capacity uh, to the situation for our clients. And, and that you know, ties back into the, the, you know, the question that we kind of posed at the beginning, what if by your mere presence, you could bring tremendous transformative capacity in your clients? Um, so that really ties back into come, come back in a circle here. Yeah. And, and very, in a very pedestrian level, um, recently I had a client reach out who was going home for the holidays, who was going to be with the in-laws and who had a lot of anxiety about being with a very difficult family. And so I um, invited her to pose, to allow herself she was very afraid of her judgments of the family. She felt that, you know, she's learned not to judge, but that, you know, she was stuffing everything. So I encouraged her to make her journey with her family a kind of exploration of what were the judgments that she had about everything that was going on and to ask these four questions to what was happening. And she came back from that holiday completely transformed. Um, so you can do it on a very practical pedestrian level. Yeah, what else is coming in? Reciprocal transformation. Yes. Yes, totally. Thank you, Fiona. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Going beyond labeling, we free ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah. So w when we start to look at, you know, this, this work is a gateway to a, a deeper level of self-understanding, which is about, you know, really transcending limitations. Um, and, and bring that in a very accessible way into our coaching work. Um, this ties back into what got me starting this course with Kelly in the first place is that there's a tremendous wealth of knowledge out there from spiritual and mystical and uh, all sorts of traditions as well as some modern scientific neuroscientific stuff about um, accessing deep levels of interconnection and how our experience is a reflection of consciousness and what basically this is all about. Um, and we can start to use those teachings, reinterpret them for coaching practice, you know, for really depth coaching practice. There is a lot that we can bring in, um, you know, and, and we have, we've had some dialogues on interfaith stuff. Um, 
really whatever you believe, whatever really touches you deeply can be brought into your um, coaching work in a very profound way. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely do this exercise in ourselves before working with challenging clients or situations because where is the challenge? The challenge is within us, actually. If we see that the situation is challenging, that is us seeing it. Okay, good. I am another you. I exist, hence you exist. Yes. Wow, so awesome. I think that uh, Ram Charan and I um, really just want to open the doors of possibility that the coaching field is really one uh, that is a very spiritually deep service um, that we can kind of, you know, break the, go across all the boundaries and borders of what we think coaching is meant to be and expand into, as Ram Charan said, the places that we love, the places that we feel passion, the places we've been inspired. And in our case, um, you know, so much in the um, Buddhist and um, Advaitic traditions and um, bring that in because it it creates so much possibility. Um, Pankaj says it is transformative for the self and a transformed coach is enough with his or her mere presence. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. To be transformational coaches, we need to be in our own transformation. Yeah. I'm intrigued about how to make a habit of going to presence quickly especially when in the grip. Great one. That's a great one. Ramcharan, I think you're, you're, the, you're the dude for that. You're the major dude. Hmm. Well, presence is never absent. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it's a matter of learning to recognize, and it, it's sort of like exercise. You know, you exercise, you get your muscles, and you know how to respond quickly. Um, so I think some and all, this is also something we'll touch on in the course of what sort of daily practice can you bring in in your life that um, familiarizes you with the choice you have to engage in a situation or to inquire. Um, so if you're really interested in that question, that very question, how to make a habit of going to presence quickly, especially when in the grip, that question itself will lead you to the answer. And I would, I love what is aware of being in the grip and be with that that's aware. Mm. Then the grip doesn't have to go anywhere. Something's aware of the grip. What is that something? Yeah, and that may seem like a small point, but actually it's huge. When there's, again, no judgment, no arguing reality, okay, a grip came up. Do I really know that it shouldn't be there? No. There's no argument with it. With it. Being is enough, yes. Yeah. Now there's, de- there's many deaths to this. Absent. Yes. I always meditate. Yes. Good. Sorry. Go yeah. ahead. Robert. Well, also I was going to say presence is never absent. Well, you know, you, it's important not to get stuck on a, any point of view, even a statement like that, that just sounds like, huh, what does that mean? Okay. Let me sit with that. Presence is never absent. Well, uh, we can also start to look within what we're calling absence. Uh, and that is an even deeper level of inquiry that, you know, I call more tantric, um, where you know any point of view has an equal opposite valid point of view and it, it it's um i'll just leave it there for now we have a whole mm-hmm. class devoted to that in the in the um in the course we'll be doing in the selfless coach presence isn't a skill and do you know what ramcharan we have yeah. um seven minutes so what i'm gonna um suggest is we um just engage a little further with dialogue and then um a quick riff on selfless coach and then let everybody go on to their day or night or night yes or afternoon <laughs> wherever you are in the world yeah and there was a request earlier to have the original nisargadatta maharaj's quote uh, uh just put on the screen okay. again i can do that put that, put that to sure. first Thank you. one up. we can revisit that you know having been through a journey come back to where we started and see what that uh, feels like now <laughs> There we go. Yeah, so let's take a look at this again. A quiet mind is all you need. All else will happen rightly once your mind is quiet. As the sun on rising makes the world active, so does self-awareness affect changes in the mind. 
In the light of calm and steady self-awareness, inner energies wake up and work miracles without any effort on your part. Now, I don't know about you, but as I read this now from the place that we've kind of shifted into through this, this work today, it's, there's something inside that loves this statement. There's an ease, there's an effortlessness and a sense that I don't have to do um, self-awareness. It's, it's all we need to do is inquire a bit into our experience and into who and what we are and what is real and self-awareness wakes up. Um, is there any other responses to that? Please put in the chat. Silence, even better. <laughs> okay. So, so Kelly, why don't we move a little bit into talking about our um, course we're developing. Okay. Thank you everybody so much for such vulnerable and generous sharing and participating. Yes, really. Yeah. Um, so just a quickie about the selfless coach. Um, Ram Charan, why don't you do it? Well, it's going to be really interesting, I think. You know, the sort of exploration we did today where we bring in some theoretical and then go into some really uh, experiential work. Um, we're going to be working with a smaller group, so it'll be much more in-depth. There'll be a lot of opportunity for people to, to have a lot of direct uh, work. Um, and then to really, um, we're going to look through all sorts of lenses. We're looking at more somatic coaching. We're looking at the neuroscience. We're looking at, you know, how energy fields interact, what science can say about that. And then we go into something like we did today and then go even deeper into, you know, really what is core, what is our core reality. And we start to move through uh, different models like um, different types of tantras, what they can teach us about uh, interchanges of energy, how to awaken energy in our clients through our coaching work. Uh, we're gonna look at trauma and how that often blocks uh, our nervous system feeling safe. Um, and we're going to look at uh, coaching as healing, which I'm very excited about that, uh, and also about what different mystical and sacred traditions um, from East and West and indigenous peoples can teach us, um, you know, about ourselves and about uh, interactions and what, how that can influence um, our coaching. And we really want to support people in, in making their own discoveries, journeys of discovery about themselves, journeys to help them uh, develop Kind of more mastery level of presence and you know even other than than learning about these models and tools let's see what kind of tools uh, people can develop for themselves so it's really it's going to be a really great exploration plus from charan and i are tons of fun to be with yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um magda's put up the link in the chat room um and we <clears throat> hope to see some of you with us um, it will be very intimate. It will be, we promise, um, very transformative for you personally and professionally. And um, thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you, Ram, for letting us be here today with yes. your amazing community. Yes, thanks, Ram. Uh, thanks a lot to you, um, Kelly and Ram Chiran, for being here. And um, from whatever was happening, there was such a tremendous amount of exchange, interchange, communication between the audience and yourself. And in, in fact, uh, somebody Francois, I think, asked a question. Uh, would you answer all the questions? I, you, I, and actually, you did many of the questions because I had put on there that in the webinar format, it may not be possible for answering all the questions. So please do ask these questions in the forum and continue this conversation. It doesn't have to end there. And that would also, for those of uh, the audience who wish to come to your course, be able to for you to give more information. So Magda would send you the link to the Kocharya forum where we open up the subject for further discussions and people can ask questions. You can post what is it that you want to convey more. I think it's an extraordinarily good session. Um, Byron Katie was, uh, has been one of my uh, great favorites. The work, uh, something I cherish. Um, multiple ways of looking at it. People talked about different models from Robert Bills to Barrett's to is based on graves and mass flows and spiral dynamics that you talked about and so on. Um, I just would like to leave this uh, piece about what Buddha said about the truth, apart from the four noble truths. Uh, the only question he said is, when you talk about the truth, when you think about the truth, 
just also question yourself, who does it benefit? And only then it's a truth. Uh, it may be a truth in our opinion, but if that truth is not going to benefit the other person or ourselves or the system, um, then that truth has no validity. So that's another way of looking at what truth is. Uh, the Rotary Club has a four-way test. People may laugh at it, but it's actually based on the Buddhist principle. It talks about, is that truth that we talk about as truth, is it fair to everybody? Is it beneficial to everybody? And in a way, the Byron Katie's work comes back to that in, in a very personal sense, um, like the question that Priya was trying to grapple with. When I think that I'm not good enough, uh, not only is it not, how is it uh, benefiting me, but perhaps it's also not benefiting a lot of other people. When we lose that faith in ourselves, we lose that love in ourselves, we are unable to give love to other people. And again, I go back to Buddha, uh, when he departed, the only thing that he said was that uh, what I am giving to you, my disciples, is the lamp that I have in my heart. And I would like you to light the lamp in your heart and in turn, allow that lamp to light other people's hearts. So what he was talking about was the love and the compassion that he was conveying to those with whom he worked and in turn that can be done. That can only happen when you genuinely feel that you are good, when you genuinely love yourself. So I just would leave at this and I would invite all of you to be uh, putting up your queries, your comments, whatever in the forum. And we do really look forward to uh, the session that you both are going to conduct. Uh, it'll be fantastic. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you, Magda. Thank, thank you, you, Kelly. Thank you, Ramkaran. Thank you, thank Bye. you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, okay. thanks, everybody. And and also, mm -hmm. please, people listening in, you know, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, feel free to contact me through Kocharya and, and reach out. And um, glad to me continue too. have any answer any questions or anything. So please. Yeah, me too. Great. Thanks, Ramcharan. Thank you, everybody. Brilliant. Thank you, Magda. <laughs> Thank you, good Rob. day, good night, good evening. Good night, good evening. <laughs>